We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Simon Hunt, consultant in the global economy, China, and the copper industry. Simon, thanks for joining me today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure, Simon. And, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about in kind of preparation for today's discussion with you is really the difference between how we see analysis based around really a US centric or a Western centric way of thinking and a Western centric hegemony versus thinking about things from more of a neutral standpoint, an objective standpoint, and or even an Eastern standpoint or way of thinking. So where do you see the biggest difference lying between those two? And is there really any crossover or is there a huge difference just because of this way of thinking? That's actually a a very deep question and requires a deep answer. Really, what is at stake is that the world which has been dominated by America and its allies for about 80 years is now threatened by the BRICS group of nations growing in maturity, setting up their own different ministries and a bank that will rival the World Bank. So what's at stake for the West is its ability to control companies, countries, and to retain its global hegemony. The Deep South, centered around BRICS and headed by China and Russia, no longer want to be controlled and dominated by America and its Western allies. So what this means is that should the BRICS group of nations, which in which many countries want to join beyond the existing 10, should this happen, then the ability of America and its allies to control events will disappear. What does this mean? If there were sensible heads, particularly in America and Europe, then diplomacy could find a medium through which the two sides can be, could be brought together. But that has not been the way for the last 20, 30 odd years, not since 1991, actually. So the risk of war is great because no way will America allow its hegemony and its currency to dominate events. So to step back a bit more, ever since 1991, and some say actually ever since the end of World War II, America's primary objective has been to dismember Russia to gain control of its natural resources. The dismantling of Ukrainians' government in 2014, perpetrated by America and the UK, which led to 
the resignation of Ukraine's legitimate government was seen by America and NATO as a stepping stone into Russia. They built the Ukrainian army trained by NATO, 400-odd thousand NATO-trained troops with NATO equipment, built these vast defense fortifications. And as it became clear in the second half of last year that Ukraine's army would be defeated, the focus started to turn towards how can NATO attack Russia, again, using Ukraine as a stepping stone. So from what we understand, plans started to be put in place sometime in the second half of last year, which led to NATO calling a meeting in early May this year, at which NATO told its member governments that there was a plan to attack Russia and that you should prepare your people for such an attack. So what do we see now? What is happening in the last re- in, in recent months has been drone and missile attacks from Ukraine into Russia itself, even into the center of Russia. Then there was the incursion of the elite Ukrainian troops with, some say, as many as 2,000 NATO member troops from various NATO member countries into the Kursk Oblast of Russia. Most people say this is an isolated event. I'm not so sure about that. I think it's more likely it is part of NATO's planned attack on Russia. What NATO is trying to do is to provoke Russia into making the first move. In turn, what is Russia going to do to retaliate? Well, the first thing which they have begun to do, gloves are taken off and they're starting to bomb and to destroy Ukraine's infrastructure, such as power plants, railways, everything. NATO had set up training schools in Ukraine in order to train specialists how to use AWACS so that Ukraine could attack and has been into the center of Russia. So what's been Russia's retaliation? to completely destroy these school outfits, including NATO instructors. What NATO has also been doing from Ukraine has been to hit and destroy Russia's oil refinery capacity. So far from what we pick up, 28 refineries have been hit. Obviously, if you destroy the oil refineries, you have no juice to fight a war. Mm -hmm. So this could be assumed to be another means of provoking Russia to make the first strike. Because if NATO is successful, in destroying the refinery capacity, then Russia has no juice to fight a war. 
So that's basically where we are now. And I think the risk now is that a bigger war will emerge before the end of this year in Europe. Now we have an explosive situation developing in Israel. Netanyahu has officially said there will be no Hamas deal, no ceasefire deal, no hostage deal. The focus has turned to the West Bank, where there has been considerable destruction and killings. The third element in the equation is Israel's objective of destroying Hezbollah. From what I understand, just recently, the America commander-in-chief in the Middle East visited the Israeli generals on the northern border to see what was being planned. Does this mean that America is going to be backing and supporting Israel in, an, in a war with Hezbollah? We'll have to wait and see. But I think given also that America has stated there is only a short time that we can keep three carrier fleets in the region. So another element that's come into the equation is that there was a border incident between Israel and Jordan which threw the Jordan population up in arms as three Israeli soldiers apparently crossed into Jordan and were killed. All sorts of rumors that the Jordan army will come in to save their friends in the West Bank. I have no idea whether that's true or not, but it's just indication that the situation is getting very explosive. So far, Iran has been advised by Putin and probably Xi in China not to immediately retaliate against Israel's killing of the Hamas leader who was invited to Tehran for the president's inauguration. What has been happening is that Moscow, Russia, has been sending into Iran very sophisticated electrical equipment, jamming equipment, S-400s, etc., etc., so that preparations have been made or are being made should there be an attack on Iran. Iran is already well prepared. It has mined the Straits of Hormuz. It has a huge missile defense buried deep in the mountains right across Iran. Even should there be a technical nuke hit on Iran, it's not going to be, it's not going to destroy those missile sites. So Iran is prepared. Will Israel strike Iran? And will America support Israel? Open question, I have no answer. But again, if you put the dots together, it is a likely development. Though in my view, probably not for a couple of years. But again, who knows? Because should Netanyahu physically start the war against Hezbollah, 
that means Syria also, and they already last weekend heavily hit Syria. It would bring Russia in. It would bring Iran in. So indirectly, and maybe this is the, the, the policy, indirectly, the war then goes between not just Israel and Hezbollah, but Russia and Iran as well. So all I'm saying is whether you look at Europe or the Middle East, it's very unsettled and very explosive. Mm -hmm. And I don't think equity markets are prepared for it. It does seem... (laughs) There, there's a lot to follow you, up. Mate. <laughs> there's a lot to follow up on there, Simon. But you know, it does seem that there is some bit of a recency bias to the equity markets of not appreciating all of these risks and the ramifications if they do escalate further. Right? If we do start to see more serious consequences from this. But one of the first things that I'd like to follow up on you with is why you think or what the incentives might be for the U.S. not to have these cooler heads or these sensible heads, as you call them, why they're not prevailing and why they're not seeing the situation for the risk that it actually poses to the world. And let's say the calm in the even in the markets or the world as it is. That's not to take away from the chaos that there is. And the lives that have been lost. But I mean, relative to how bad it could be, you know, we're not in a super hot war at this point. I think you have to go out, go back to the powers who have been controlling the deep state, stroke neocons, whatever you want to call them, whose long term objective has been to dismember Russia. They've got so far, I think it's unlikely they're going to stop now. And I think if you look at the extent to which the American financial community has stakes in Ukraine's fertile land, mortgages, etc., loans against them, it's that if if Russia took over Ukraine, all of that will be lost, money down the drain. Mm-hmm. Already I was told on Friday, whether true or not, I'm not sure yet, that <clears throat> Ukraine has defaulted on a bond. And who is the major guarantor of Ukrainian bonds? The Bank of England. So there's another part of this war equation coming in, finance, money. The West is deeply involved in Ukraine's wealth. So Russia, I mean, my personal view is that Russia now sees how serious the West is on trying to dismember Russia, that their initial plan of holding the land up to the Dnieper River, I think that that's been surpassed. They're going to control all of Ukraine for security reasons. So this is really what the war is all about. It's not just Russia. It's if we lose Ukraine, how many trillion dollars have we lost? So, Simon, it seems to me that Russia has been very strategic in much of their dealings with this conflict. Do you think that they can be provoked, as you were saying, as the West is trying to provoke them? Well, what we know is that there's huge pressure on Russia, not just from his colleagues in the Supreme Council, but across the country, because 
towns and cities are being hit by drone attacks. So, my guess, and it's no more than that, is that his retaliation will come in steps. Mm -hmm. And the first one is already in place, which is to step up destroying Ukraine. In the process, the second step is to destroy all of NATO's command and control bunker bases in Ukraine, which is already, they've already started doing that. The next stage, I, I guess, is to destroy the control and command bases in countries surrounding Russia. So as, as I would see it, it's going to be a rational, thought-out process rather than being one big bang. <clears throat> There's some who argue that it is the one big bang, like a cyber attack in a European city or a tactical nuke somewhere that would make the West sit up and say, do we want this to go any further? Mm -hmm. The answer is we have to wait and see. But all I say is that the risk of escalation is very large and it's not being marked into equity prices mm -hmm. or bond prices right, or inflation. Well, I'd like to get to all of those three pieces with you, Simon. But the last question I wanted to follow up with you on was how much of an impact have the refinery attacks on Russian soil had on their ability to produce a finished product that they can sell to the rest of the world? I don't know yet. But all I know is that as of this weekend, 28 refineries had been hit. But I've not had a chance to calculate how much the loss of gasoline that, that's meant. So it has yet to be seen, really, what the impact yeah. is. Well, from me, yeah. Right. Others will, will probably know. So then what does this, let's say, this initial impulse of war end up meaning for oil, let's say the oil markets coming into, let's say, the next six months, kind of a, a shorter term view. And I'd like to kind of split it for oil. And then next we can maybe address copper and also U.S. equities and bonds as well. Well, I think, first of all, the U.S. government has been and will con continue to use every trick to keep oil prices down in front of the election. Helped by global demand being weak. Mm -hmm. But I think that post the election, certainly by the second half of next year, you're going to see an explosion in oil prices whether it's because of a hit against Iran, and Iran will promptly close down the Straits of Hormuz. They, Iran has also told America, if there is any hit on us, we will destroy the oil fields in the Gulf. Yeah. But I think the more likely development is that Saudi and Russia will agree to limit oil production next year. And then there is the risk of a war creating an extremely tight oil market where you get oil at $150 plus. So I think that 
in the second half of next year, I think you're going to see a strong resurgence in inflation, reminiscent of what we experienced, or some of us did, in the second half of the 1970s and early 80s. First, it's very likely that by early next year, we're going to see a complete change in Fed and other Western central bank policy. Liquefy the system, liquefy the system. We've gone through some months of recession. We've got to get the economic activity going again. So you'll have see quantities of dollars and euros, etc., liquefying the systems. The dollar will probably come under severe pressure, downward pressure. Then we have oil prices rising sharply, food prices rising sharply. And by the end of 2025, early 2026, we're going to be seeing global inflation heading into double figures. And I reckon that by the end of 2026, early 2027, you will see inflation at higher levels than we saw in 1981. When America inflation was 13% and the global inflation 15%. So what does that do to long bond yields? What did we see in 1981? The last of Paul Volcker's Fed fund increases. Was it 12%, 13%? I've forgotten. It was a big figure. Well, but just to interrupt for one second, Simon, if I could. Yeah. You know, it doesn't seem that we have those tools available to us considering the debt levels now. Uh, sorry, what's the point of the question? Do we have the same ability to go oh. to those high interest rates to, you know, supposedly? Well, the, the, answer, the, the, the answer is on the long term. It's not the central banks that control interest rates. It's the market. Mm-hmm. And the market will say inflation, 13 percent in America. Ah, we're going to drive yields up to that sort of level. Mm-hmm. But then what? I mean. So then, ends up then destroying that, that, the value that, of the currency, right? That, that crashes the whole system. And what do you think the timeline for that particular situation is? 2027, 2028. So do you think that ends up being the, the cleansing of the system that we need, or is there more conflict and more, more cleansing of the system that needs to happen post that 27, 28 time period? In the early months of next year, then you have this massive liquefying process. So people look for their hedges. They see inflation beginning to rise. So your equity markets will more than double from whatever they were in the early months of next year. Mm -hmm. Base metal markets as well. But then you don't want to be the last guy standing on the dance floor. Simon, are are we already seeing, let's say, central banks and and smart money or big money starting to move in response to sensing this? I think big money is exiting paper and going into hard assets. And do you think that Yellen's visit to Beijing and the, let's say, the value of gold versus the dollar is another symptom of that, exactly what you're talking about? Well, I think Yellen's purpose was to persuade China not to dump dollar assets. Mm -hmm. But I think she failed in her mission. And I think for some time, China's leadership 
has known what's been coming and why they've been liquidating their treasury holdings. It's going to carry on. The other part of the equation is that Chinese companies, not the government, companies have parked something like $2 trillion of assets in foreign countries, large part being in America. Mm-hmm. And we know how that worked out for if Russia. Yellen, if, if, <laughs> if Powell drops interest rates, a lot of that money is going to exit and come back into China. So, Simon, what do you think the central banks, let's say in the East, if we're trying to maybe go back from first principles, what do they see the purpose of buying so much gold as being? Uh, the purpose is is very simple. Mm-hmm. People are fed up seeing the dollar or other fiat currencies falling in value. I mean, for instance, in 1980, US dollar is now worth 25 cents. Where's your purchasing power? And I think slowly, not just in the developing world, but amongst the smaller countries, that realization has started to sink in. So it's a, it's back to how can I retain my purchasing power? It's not through dollars. It's not through the euro. It's not through the yen. At least Russia and China have got large quantities of gold. China's citizens hold around 25,000 tons. And the government, through various ministries, including the PLA, probably own another 25,000 tons. Mm -hmm. But I, I suspect that within a couple of years, within, China will announce our currency is supported by the gold which our citizens own, and they will give out the figure. And Russia has much more than is being reported, north of 12,000 tons. So what is the purpose or the difference between the, let's say, central bank or or government-held gold in China versus the privately held gold? Privately held gold has been bought from the Shanghai Gold Exchange since it was set up in 2002. You can calculate how much has been taken out. Mm -hmm. It's about 25,000 tons. And then on top of that, ever since the early 1950s, China has imported gold often through the unreported PLA system, which is why the PLA owns a very large tonnage of gold. I know that from a friend who actually visited their main warehouse. Mm -hmm. So, Simon, we hear many problems that China has with their economy. You know, let's take the housing sector or housing values at this point. That's been pointed to as being a big crash for some of their credit markets. Do you see that as being more easily or more more readily managed by the Chinese authorities rather than, let's say, the same type of situation in the West? Well, I think the first thing one has to bear in mind is that this was an engineered crash by the leadership because she wanted to replace the speculative fever in real estate to transfer those assets into productive use for manufacturing and technology. The second facet was, by so doing, it reduced or reduces 
the leverage that local governments have over central government. So now the central government has the upper hand, has the leverage over local governments. So the central government will in future be bearing the cost of a lot of what local governments used to bear. So it's a sense part of the process of centralization of power. Now, what's interesting is that China's government fiscal and monetary policy, despite the crash in real estate, has been as the attitude has been very conservative. It's part of a long process of reducing net assets. They know that China's consumers have huge savings. So the economy is not about to collapse. On the contrary, go back 10 years ago, see the statements that she made even then, which is that China's leadership then saw the risk of war developing as a real risk and started to make contingency plans. Those contingency plans include, just in the last one to two years, private factories having to allocate factory floor space to the production of goods for the PLA. So basically, my sense is that the government is holding its far power back until and if a war does break out. And then, because confidence would then collapse, then they would be very aggressive in fiscal and monetary policies. So it's basically, we will allow the economy, we won't see the economy in their workings. They don't see the economy falling into recession. They put enough of a flaw under it already, but growth will be very slow. Simon, one of the other pieces that I wanted to ask you about was in one of your recent reports. You were pointing to the, let's say, the demographics problem for the U.S. as it's also facing this baby boomer retirement phase that adds more pressure to the to the medical system, more pressure to the entitlement system. How does that, let's say, compare the demographics problem in the U.S. to China as well? Or is China in better or worse shape than the U.S. from an age of its population standpoint and productive capacity as well? I think if I remember that America's demographic problem comes sooner than China's. China's will certainly get very difficult by 2030, but they've been planning for it. Mm -hmm. It is why they have put so much emphasis on robotics, automation, you go around a Chinese factory today, you only see a few guys. So the problem is that you're going to have it's the ratio between the working population and retirees. That's when it when it gets very difficult. But I from memory, that's not until around 2030. I think one of the other issues around maybe the, this recency bias or the calm 
in the markets. I think I think one of the things that I'm taking from your from our chat today is that there is major volatility ahead for the markets for you know even the world but you know let's say specifically the markets but i think one of the let's say the ideas that can affect the markets to be so stable are some of these cpi and let's say gdp prints so simon what sense do you think there is for the the authenticity of many of the the US let's say gdp numbers and maybe explain to us the difference between gdp and gdi numbers both are supposed to produce the same or similar result mm-hmm. but the gap between the two has risen very sharply again speaking from memory last year gdp came in at just over 3%, I think 3.2%. GDI, 0.3%. In the first half of this year, GDI came in at, I think, one3 and GDP around 3%. And, and what is the difference in how those are measured? Well, which is, which is the... Which... Is GDP the real number reflecting economic activity or GDI? Mm-hmm. When you look at, when you deflate retail sales by CPI, when you look at the real employment numbers that companies see and not what the government pretends it is, and you look at the real level of inflation, which is not the CPI one, then it's the GDI figure that is a better reflection of real business activity. So we see actually the U.S. economy being in recession now. And does that extend to much of the world? And you can say much of the rest of the world is either in recession or on the brink of being in recession and will be in recession by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I think what's propped up services sector has been strong equity markets. If we're correct, those will correct sharply. And you're already seeing the services PMI falling, starting to correct also. You know, it, it almost seems like a debt-based or, or an MMT-based way or strategy of going about, you know, providing information to the economy. How long do you think governments can get away with, you know, fudging these statistics? <laughs> this comes to a much wider <laughs> subject, which is that... The media controls the the disinformation about everything. It's almost as if, tongue in cheek, the CIA and the MI6 every night sends out a hymn sheet to the media. This is what you will write around. And actually, you had the head of the CIA and the MI6 having a joint discussion with the financial times and all it all they came out with this disinformation oh ukraine is winning the war putin has lost it i mean come on so it's it's as though the governments today are running scared that their people have begun to see through this nonsense put out by governments, whether it's on economies, whether it's on politics, whether it's on the war or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're running frightened. I mean, look at the election results in Germany. Look at how the farmers in Europe have been revolting. 
Look at what's going on in the UK, let alone what's going on in America. Yeah, there's certainly sim- more than enough symptoms of, you know, unrest and distrust within the populations of, you know, everywhere that you mentioned. And, you know, I think to to kind of summarize and, and tie this all together, if you would, Simon, just give us a little bit of a summary on what you expect, let's say, for the markets over the next six months and then kind of into that medium term time frame of that 2728 well over the next 6 months all markets are going to be very volatile equity and base markets the trend is going to be down sharply we'll probably see global equity markets s&p included falling by 30 to 40% by early next year if i use copper as the example for base metal markets We'll probably see copper by early next year at 6,500 mm-hmm. instead of circa 9,000 today. Then central banks and governments will inflate the system. And then you get for the next two odd years what I call the last hurrah with equity markets and base metal markets more than doubling from their lows of early next year. Inflation takes off, long-term interest rates move higher, and by the end of 2027, early 2028, you don't want to be the last guy on the dance floor as the world will then basically collapse because long-term bonds will be in double-digit figures, which will crash the system. Well, Simon, I really appreciate how you laid all of this out for us. And again, this idea that we started with of comparing, let's say, US or Western-centric scope of the world versus more of a nuanced and neutral way of looking at things I really appreciate you walking us through all of these different pieces and how you see them. For anybody that's interested in in reading more of Simon's work, that's all available at simon-hunt.com. And he has a great Substack as well, shss.substack.com. Simon, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with to consider before we wrap up today? No, I think we've covered everything and you've let your listeners know where they can get hold of me. So I think we've said enough. Well, on that happy note, I really appreciate your time today, Simon. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I look forward to the next. Thank you very much, Tom. Pleasure being on your show. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.